do is I just need to do, uh, take a roll call, um, and then we'll go from there. So, uh, Eichert is here. Armstrong? Yeah. Bigger? Here. Clausen? Here. Kester? Here. Link? Here. Wilson? Present. Okay. Um, before we get started, because of the COVID era that we live in, the Municipal Planning Commission is conducting this meeting in person and via conference call in accordance with the Municipal Government Act, Section 199. Municipal Planning Commission meetings can take place in person with more than 15 people indoors as long as physical distancing of two meters can be maintained between participants. At this time, according to Alberta Health Public attendance at municipal planning meetings should be facilitated through virtual means. As per Wheatland County Policy 7.13, members of the public are not permitted to speak unless the Commission agrees to hear them. If the Commission agrees to allow the public to speak, the Chair will call upon the specific individuals at that time. Please note this call is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website and or social media. To eliminate background noise, please mute your phone during the meeting, unless you are talking. Everyone has the right to be present at an MPC meeting. Any attendees that are considered disruptive to the process will be removed as per Ms. MGA Section 198. Thank you for your cooperation and understanding. <sighs> okay, I guess that's the call to order. So we have the uh, copy of the Unapproved minutes before us. We have um, to move the agenda. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. It's uh, we have an agenda copy of the agenda before us. Um, are there any admissions or deletions? I will. Oh. Seeing none. I'll move the agenda as presented. Uh, Councillor Wilson has. Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Wilson has moved the agenda. Um, I will make another note. We will be working on, I will be asking if there's any uh, negative votes. If there's a negative vote, then we will take a, a roll call. But if there's no, if there are no votes against a, a, um, a motion, then it will be deemed passed. Um, do I hear any negative votes on the agenda? Hearing none. <laughs> I move the agenda. Adoption of the minutes. So moved. Uh, Commissioner Armstrong has moved the minutes. Any negative? Hearing none, the minutes are passed, carried. Okay, we are on to DP 2020-040. Good morning. MPC. The application before us is DP 2020-040 for a compost facility. And unless MPC wishes that I go through all the details, I'm presuming that you've um, read the details of the application and I'm just going to jump ahead to some of the mapping. So we're looking at Appendix A here, which is the location map. So we're south of Highway 901. Um, on the access road into Cars Land Range Road 260. Um, we have, I'll go through some of the circulation responses that we, in summary, so here was our circulation area, Appendix B, we're on page 14 of the agenda. We had nine circulation responses from residents. Uh, three were in the hamlet of Cars Land, one was in Speargrass, and the rest were in the two mile radius circulation area. So um, some of the comments we received, a lot of them were, they were the, of similar concern. So um, support for composting in general, however, concerns regarding odor, pollution, potentially excess of material on site, um, causing odor, um, excessive in feed piles, excessive compost piles, maybe some concern with leachate or um, and should there be soil testing, water testing, perhaps that 
the facility could attract insects or birds or have um, a large amount of traffic or trash blowing around the property. So those, that's kind of a summary of the uh, most common concerns that were brought up. Um, we did circulate to, to AEP and they said that an application, they have received an application, an EPEA application, and they did say that they have no concerns with the application at this time. Um, the limits of finished compost stipulated, stipulated by the municipality must be adhered to. So the AEP doesn't have any stipulations. It's just site specific, what the site can hold. But um, the municipality may institute their own limitations. So, um, so they say if the amount of storage at the site causes concerns, AEP would request that the concerns be addressed immediately. Concerns would include any odor or environmental concerns that the public may call in. If the application has stated a storage limit for a finished product, then the Muni must hold them to that limit. The registration that AEP issues usually has no limit specified. However, the proponent is bound to stay within the proposed application. We did circulate also to Alberta Health Services, and they did not have many concerns as long as there is a registration through AEP and monitoring by AEP. They did also bring up odor mitigation, groundwater management, optimal composting conditions to destroy pathogens, and that they said that the manufacturer's specifications say the process will produce a relatively stable compost product and that the product may require some pass passive maturation prior to final testing. So they recommended that they be tested by AEP or the county. Um, internal circulation, um, our environmental coordinator had minimal minimal environmental concerns as long as odor mitigating garbage and dust are controlled. And she also brought up the leachate section of the equipment specs that say hot rots produce a small amount of condensate which can be used for irrigation, wetting, maturation piles or discharge to the sewer. So she's just wondering if there could be an incentive based on the cost of energy to not fully dry the material that maybe we should ask for a plan of what they're going to do with the leachate, well, not leachate, the condensate, um, as disposing to the sewage system could be an option, even if it's just water. Um, our planner was concerned about the amount of finished product that they can store on site and whether we have the capability to accurately measure how much is in a pile. She also did mention that there was two houses nearby and we have to keep them resident in mind. Composting machines will be inside a shop, so she wondered if there was a risk of, of CO buildup. And uh, with so many different uses on this parcel, should a blanket emergency response plan be asked for? So um, I'm going to move now on to page 15, which is some aerial photos. And I'm just going to kind of address some of these comments that we received. So first of all, the, the way that the operation is run is that the applicants have a subscription service. So if you get a subscription to have your diapers picked up, they will go to your home and pick up your diapers. And that is how the product gets to the site. So it's, it's not people dropping off product at the site. So they, that's how they, they make their money on a subscription service. Um, the site is on a paved road and it is established with existing infrastructure trees and interior roads. There are two residences very uh, nearby the site with several others located in the near vicinity where all of these orange dots are, are all the rural addresses. Um, the business previously operating on site had a higher amount of traffic than this combination of businesses proposes to have. So our transfer, transportation and infrastructure department did not have any concerns regarding traffic. There are two other businesses that have received permits for this site already. Um, and there are two other uses that may be using the site. One is an application we've already received, hasn't been approved yet, and one is 
outside of the jurisdiction of Wheatland County, so we have no um, we have no jurisdiction to authorize or not approve the other use that's going on there. The end feed material, as you probably know, is used disposable diapers, including children, adult, compostable, and regular. And they are going to combine that with other green bin organic materials and pre-packaged food waste. So everything is unloaded in the building. There's no unloading that will be occurring outside of the building. And then the placed into the hopper, the feed hopper with wood chips to be used as a bulking agent. So, um, so there was an example provided by the applicant of this hot rot composter um, within the city of Vancouver. However, their in-feed material was food waste, not diapers. So it, although they did not receive any complaints about their operation, it wasn't diapers that they were composting. So we did, um, so the applicant has purchased that composting machinery from that site in Vancouver. We did include a condition that no in-feed material may be stored outside and only indoors in the amount specified in the conditions. A condition has also been added specifying the amount of wood chips stored for the bulking agent that will be allowed to be stored outside. As far as odors go, if we go, um, let's see, we'll look at here at the drawing, the labeled diagrams here. All processed air will be processed through a biofilter to remove odors. There is potential that in-feed materials may cause odors even if stored inside. So a condition has been added for a complaint hotline recommending approval of a temporary one-year permit with the potential for non-renewal if odor complaints do come in. The exhaust comment we did um, asked the applicant who specified that the machines do not produce any carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a product of incomplete combustion of fossil fuels, not bacterial action, which produces compost. The exhaust is vented outside through biofilters to remove any odors. As far as the condensate, uh, machines do not produce leachate. Leachate is a water that has percolated through a pile and dissolved some of its constituents, does not occur in enclosed machines. Small amounts of moisture may condense out in the ventilation pipe since the compost is moist, and the processed air will evaporate some of the moisture. Condensate, which is essentially just water in this case, is collected into containers for proper disposal. Condensed water, which is collected, may be added back into the machine or to the completed compost as it dries, or since it's only water, it can be disposed of in the sewer system. As far as the pathogens go, Reactor stirs the compost hourly, injects air to provide oxygen needed by the bacteria. Moisture will be monitored at it as necessary. With the correct mix of nitrogen and carbon providing feedstock, the machine will run at 60 to 65 degrees centigrade, which destroys pathogens. Requirements for finished compost set by, are set by the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment, or the CCME. The non-compostable material, so the pre-packaged food waste, um, comes from grocery stores and it's stuff that expired or whatever. So they will, instead of opening every package and emptying the contents, they just compost it as is and it will all be stored inside prior to delivery to the recycling facility or landfill. So there is some um, leftover materials from the packaging. So that stuff is not allowed to be stored outside according to our conditions. All of that has to be stored inside the building and then disposed of at the appropriate location. Finished pr product storage. So the letter of intent indicates an area and height of the piles. This has been placed as a condition in the maximum amount, amount of finished product that can be stored on site. And the enforcement of the pile volumes, there is a potential for the piles of finished compost, bulking agents, or other materials stored outside to exceed the limits proposed by the applicant and specified in the conditions. However, having the specific volumes in the conditions allows us to enforce if the pile heights exceed those volumes. Our policy evaluation, I'm gonna to go to, here we are still on page 17 here, just looking at some photos. There's no IDP or ASP in the area. The land use bylaw um, has an 
a definition for a compost facility and it's a discretionary use in the IT district. So it does meet the definition. The MDP, it does meet the MDP in most respects. It is, however, in close proximity to two residences and many acreages in the area, so potentially could be considered a non-compatible use. However, the MDP says the potential effects, unless the potential effects are mitigated. So we believe we have mitigated them with the conditions. So in the conclusion on page eight of the agenda, um, you will see my conclusion and my conditions. Staff are recommending approval for the compost facility with the proposed conditions based on the following. Due to the non-traditional composting process being used and that a relatively small amount of infeed material will be stored inside the building. Also, that the pile heights of all the materials being stored outside will be 10 feet in height or less specified in the letter of intent. We propose that the measures taken are adequate to mitigate adverse impacts. So therefore, staff are recommending that the permit be issued also for a one-year term to determine if there are any adverse effects. So um, the three standard options, MPC can approve or not approve or come up with an alternative recommendation of your own choosing. And that concludes my presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions and the applicant is online as well. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, would Commission care to ask any questions of the applicant? Uh, just for clarification, in your lead in here, it says in 2018 they contacted Wheatland County along with several other to find out the requirements for setting up the facility. They actually talked to our staff and, and tried to get our staff to allow them to put containers at our transfer sites to collect this stuff. When I found out about it, I took it to the uh, executive committee of the uh, Drumheller Solid Waste Association because they're in control of those sites and what comes off of those sites. And uh, we didn't even take it to the board. We said, absolutely not. It's a biohazard. We don't want to have anything to do with it. There was no end use for it. It was just basically a storage pile. And uh, we said, absolutely not. So what they're saying here is not quite right. As far as I phoned uh, our EDO yesterday and talked to her about this, and uh, she said, "Be very, very careful with it because it is a biohazard. Uh, we don't know who the end user is. What do they do with the waste material that comes out of there? There's a possibility that it could end up in our landfill, and she's not sure if she wants to deal with something like that. It should be if, if it's a biohazard. So, how much do they stockpile on site? before they start producing, how much do they need to keep on site? Uh, personally, I'm opposed to it in more ways than one, so. Um, <clears throat> so do we want to have a response from the, allow the, I think we should allow him to speak. So if, So I, uh, hearing from commissioners, no, it, it seems to be we will we'll allow questions to be asked. Can, you, can the, uh, sorry, I, I'm not aware of the name of the person that's online representing these, Mr. Florence. Uh, so uh, Mr. Florence, sir, can you answer any of these questions about it being a, uh, used diapers being considered a biohazard? Um, yes, um, I want to. Mark Rishenkopf is also on, right? My partner. Um, bio, I guess you're correct. Used diapers are a biohazard, and that's why we want to get them out of the landfills where they're currently going. I mean, right? The, the concern about um, diapers going to the landfill is very correct because that's where they're all going right now. So our point was to get them out of the landfill, compost them, destroy the pathogens in the composting process, and then we have a, a useful product at the end of it. Does the commission have any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Who's responsible for the testing? 
Is there testing before and then testing during and after? And who's responsible? Who would be responsible for that? Um, well, before compost is able to be sold, it has, it has to be tested by the CCME. Um, and, and, and that's the environment um, to meet certain requirements in terms of, oh, um, allowable amount of plastics in the compost, which is very, very minimal. It's got to be tested for pathogens to make sure they're, they're, they've all been destroyed. Um, it's got to be tested for various various uh, minerals and metals, and uh, it's quite an extensive list before it's able to be sold. And like, who? Uh, what about groundwater? Is there testing done well, with that? Or? There is a, on a normal composting facility. There is because we're going to be entirely inside. Um, we're not, we're not storing the uh, pre-composting material on the ground. We're not doing the composting on the ground. It's all in the machine, so we're not. Um, we don't need to test the groundwater because we're not affecting it. We're not dumping anything on the ground until it, the compost is done. So we, we won't have the pathogens leaking into the ground. We won't have leachate because there's, there's you know we don't have piles of material exposed to the environment. And, and what about the odor inside with, um, with it being a multi-use facility? Um, that that odor inside, I, I can't imagine that uh, it would be bearable. Well, one of the things that will help with that is our the process there for the machine is drawn from the inside. So we'll be drawing air from the inside that will run through the machines and then through the and then through the biofilters. So that should mitigate our order inside. Um, if it doesn't, uh, we can put additional measures in. Um, and I don't really want to work in a place that smells like dirty diapers all the time either. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, there's, there's, there's other things setting up. Um, that are going to cause odors out in that area too. That will, I mean, odors inside of in, inside of a plant are, are kind of normal. But we're going to do everything we can to mitigate them because we got to live in there too. What kind of volumes are you looking at? Um, we're starting at at five tons per day, and expanding up to up to seven and a half tons a day within a year. In terms of volume, you process, you're processing that much a day, or you're or you're storing that much on site. How much do you process? That that's processing. Okay. So how much is we're, on site? We will uh, our storage on site. Our diapers we don't plan on, on storing at all because they stink. We just want to bring them in daily and put them into the machines. We could store up to three days worth of food waste in in in. Uh, Basically, twenty-yard bins that are brought into the into the building because that's easier. It's easier to bring it in that way for, the, for our suppliers. So we have up to three. We would have up to three days supply of of, of organics inside the inside the building. So to, so to create five ton of used product every single day, that's that's a fairly substantial volume that you've got coming in there. What kind of volume are you looking at as far as a, are you collecting that many diapers that you're going to have that much volume coming in every single day? We hope to have that, that. That would come out to about eight cubic meters of material every day. So the majority of this is going to be prepackaged food waste? Uh, ideally, it's going to be about half and half. If we can, that's the, the it depends on whether we can get up diaper subscriptions to get it up to half, but no more no more than half will be diapers, and the other half will be food waste. And if you don't get it, the quantity of diapers, and it all becomes food waste. Uh, Vice versa. Basic, basically, but well, we are, we already have a, you know we're, we're we're storing in Calgary right now. But basically, yeah, we we we, we can put up to half. Up to half, 
of the material can be diapers. The rest of it may be food waste. So we don't think we, we can have less than half material that can be diapers depending on what we have to do or what the government is our business. So what happened to the, it, you said this uh, facility was run in Vancouver? Why did it, uh, do you know what, maybe you don't know, but do you have any idea why they quit doing it? Uh, they, they went bankrupt. They had uh, opened a facility in Ontario and spent a lot of money or got their permits to operate and that put them under financially. Thank you. Are you aware that the composting guidelines for Alberta are be currently under review with Alberta Environment and Parks? They're supposed to be having it uh, released later this year. Yeah, I've, they're, I've uh, been in contact with Alberta Environment on that. Um, they're not concerned about what we're doing right now, and that it'll fit into what they're what's, what's coming in down the down the road too. That's one of the discussions we've had with them. Is they didn't had never considered composting diapers when they're writing the new, new guidelines. So now they are. Just as a follow up on that, AEP told me that potentially in the new um, code of practice, this type of thing would will be a pilot project. That's how they would class it. But as for right now, it would just they wouldn't fit it under the current COP. So in saying that, they haven't done a pilot project yet. They're going to wait till the new codes come in. Then they'll set up a pilot project. So these guys are going to get in underneath the line before we know what the effects of it are. Commissioner Link. Just a question about what the plans are to mitigate the impacts of the outdoor storage of the finished compost. Any potential impacts like odor? Um. Well, finished compost, I mean, it has basically, it smells like dirt, essentially. Um, we have secured a a large tent to store the compost in um, to, to uh, reduce the environmental impact on, 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 the, on the pile, so it won't, it won't get rained on and, and it won't, it won't get blown around. Um, compost. For the garden center, that's what, that's what it'll smell like. Yeah, it's pro properly composted materials it just smells like dirt. Um, so I, I don't know what other impacts we, we'd be worrying about. I mean, we're going to make sure it doesn't blow around. We're make sure it doesn't the water doesn't leach through it and cause problems. But, but properly composted material doesn't have an unpleasant odor. So a question, what, um, what did your company, um, how did your company go about doing the public consultations? Because we, we seem to receive a, a bit of negative feedback for this. Well, we have done a lot of public consultations. Sorry, Burns. we cannot hear you. Up oh, there. Wait a second, did I get muted again? No, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, we haven't done a lot of public consultation. Um, I've talked to a few people who have expressed concerns. Um, other than that, we've left it to Suzanne to circulate and get responses back. And tried to and then address those responses, those concerns as they came in, because we're not we're not resident out there. We don't actually know anybody or very few people out there. Um, I know that our our landlords have talked to quite a few people because they're they're, they're our residents in, in in the facility or in the, in the, in the municipality. Um, just want to bring up. I want to bring up one thing on this. In terms of the the concern about biohazards, in the fields right next to the, the facility out there this week, the city of Calgary has been dumping raw sewage. 
injecting it into the ground. Um, that can't be any worse than anything we, we would propose. In fact, it's, we're, we're going to be a lot better than that. Does the commission have any other questions? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I had trouble with my mute button. Yeah, I got a, I don't know if the concerns, I got some comments on the condition. Uh, I would like to see, you mentioned uh, you found a tent or have a tent for the finished pile. I would like to see as a condition that the finished compost is stored inside in a definite size building. So that way the pile will fit all in that building. And uh, also with the wood chips, uh, just make the tent a little bit bigger and maybe store the wood chips in there too. I'd like to see all that stored inside away from the weather. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing that is a is, uh, concern for me is all the comments we received. I wouldn't be prepared. If I was to make a decision today, wouldn't like it. We have to have uh, open houses, community engagement here, and that's really not the, the county's uh, preview to sell this. I think the proponent should be doing open houses and uh, when the residents are comfortable and they're happy with, so to say, then I would be in a more favorable position. But as the residents right now are not in agreement, I would have a hard time voting for it. But at, at the very least, I think everything should be stored inside with, uh, with uh, I don't know, the flooring. I think that should be determined too. Uh, cement would be nice, okay? Permission to speak? Sorry, this is? Uh, Brian Sevek, local resident. I'm online. I will uh, ask the commission. Does the commission wish to hear from a... Go ahead, Mr. Sevek. Thank you uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, I returned from holidays and have a very ill mother-in-law right now, and, and it's uh, delayed my involvement in this, but I have uh, very significant concerns about the community risks associated with this project. Uh, in my working life, I'm chair of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Mount Royal University, and uh, although not a uh, composting expert, I do have some uh, significant uh, concerns over the environmental uh, issues associated with this project. Uh, first, I wonder whether it is properly designated as, as a composting facility. Perhaps it should be considered as a major or minor waste management facility given the described waste diversion, multiple waste streams, waste storage, waste separation, waste processing elements of the proposal. I agree that there are significant biohazard risk and management associated with this facility, and that's primarily due to the feedstock. Um, there's been little offered in terms of, of, of describing in any kind of detail the containment issues, uh, washing, sanitation, facility, wastewater, any process wastewater, uh, worker and health uh, safety concerns. There's going to be substantial enteric pathogens, now including COVID-19 associated with soil diapers. There's going to be airborne microbes. And currently, the plan is to house this facility in a basic industrial bay with no HVAC air handling uh, capacities uh, and apparently no air, indoor air quality concerns other than there's going to be an inflow of air into the, in the, into the process. Uh, there was mention in the, in the proposal of shipping containers that are already uh, in place in Calgary containing uh, and it was described as some shipping container, containers of, of contaminated soil diapers, uh, which would be extremely biohazardous. Um, 
<clears throat> There's also little discussion of the fate of the non-compostable materials. The bag currently plans for bag and recycling it, but it's not possible right now for that, as I understand it. Uh, the composting diapers element, uh, there seems to be an inappropriate reliance on proponent and manufacturer descriptions of system cap capabilities and environmental performances. Uh, the manufacturer has a long history of, 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 uh, of systems, but uh, there's very scant detail on, on, on actually any successes in, in diaper feedstocks. Uh, certainly, it's all web-based by the proponent and the manufacturer. There's no objective and no peer-reviewed published studies of the efficacy or the environmental performance of these systems. Uh, <clears throat> the nuisance owners, uh, there's no proof of concept. Uh, Biofilters and nuisance odor control are very complex operations. And, uh, uh, you know, the City of Calgary struggles with it uh, at their wastewater treatment uh, plants uh, big time. Uh, there's an inappropriate reliance on an odor-free guarantee uh, that seems to be offered by the manufacturer. Uh, there's no monitoring systems, protocols that are described in any way whatsoever. Uh, there's little description or no description of any follow-up action that would be taken if nuisance odors are, are detected by operators or by, by the community. Uh, the regulatory framework is being described already today as, as a very novel feedstock with nobody or heart having experience with this. Presumably, the proponent will register with the AAP and eventually, uh, again, eventually get the approvals, will follow, follow codes of practice and standards, and the, the compost will meet CCME guidelines for compost quality. However, there's no mention of this in the proposal, even though it's been acknowledged that there's an August 1st startup date and, and the equipment is on site as right now, as I understand. Uh, the compost quality, uh, market uncertainties are, I think, a big issue. Uh, the contamination, uh, there should be real concerns with excreted and feces-bound pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a huge environmental issue that's emerging and uh, 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 diapers uh, in terms of urine contamination, um, and, and especially if they're coming from care homes, uh, there's going to be a lot of pharmaceuticals, and these contaminants are going to be a great concern if there's compost linkages to the food chain. Um, and by the way, the city of Calgary is not uh, is, is not injecting raw sewage into our soil. It's, it's a complex process that Kelgro uh, has perfected. Uh, and, and even then there are some, some concerns, with, especially with heavy metals, but uh, uh, they do testing, they're full, they, it's a well-known, well-understood process. Um, why not Calgary? This is a Calgary problem. The proponents in their websites describe uh, a, a municipal solid waste uh, problem in terms of, of diapers um, and uh, to me uh, especially if they're collecting in Calgary it's a Calgary problem and a Calgary facility and solution is desirable. On their website they also um, uh, mention uh, their lack of success in convincing the city of Calgary um, uh, to, to consider diaper composting. Um, so Generally speaking, I think we see a history of failure and a lack of experience in operating an industrial composting site. Uh, there seems to be a failed business legacy associated with this. Uh, there seems to be very little documented and especially any objective studies uh, outlining the success of diaper composting. Uh, the very equipment that was acquired was, a, was part of a failed business adventure and it was for organic not for diaper. Um, I have some real concerns about this legacy failure, about decommissioning of the site and, and the contamination of the site if it should fail. So that's a snapshot of, I think, a lot of unknowns and uncertainties, and most of the information that we're getting is proponent or manufacturer based, and uh, that is concerning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, now, I'm just going to, I don't, if, no, if the commission doesn't have any more points, I'm just going to 
sort of flesh out what I'm, I'm thinking I'm hearing here. The, the compost uh, regulations are, from AEP, are being redone as we speak with the, the changes and amendments. I would really like, personally, I would really like to see them before we make any decision on this. Um, they bring up, a, Donna brought up a great question about, about who pays for the testing. And along that vein, I think the county needs to explore like a cap levy bylaw so that we can look at gate fees or tipping fees for any landfill or any composting site that we put in, that we allow into the county in order to pay for it. Because all this stuff is, the bottom line is, if there's going to be testing required, it is going to fall to us. We're going to end up bearing that burden. So I think we should probably direct administration to start looking at some sort of a, a cap levy bylaw. Um, I'm, I would like to see more and better public consultation. So I think maybe we get administration to, to, to talk, um, and suggest how, how this can be carried out. I don't think this is, it's not the county's responsibility. I believe this is the, the, um, the, the applicants, because they have to satisfy that what they are doing is going to, is, is not going to be causing a problem down the road. So I, I believe there's a lot of questions here and I believe a deferral is necessary. So I'd be willing to put a motion that MPC defer DP 2020-40 so that the commission can review the AEP updated composting regulations and together with and, and get staff um, to undertake <clears throat> public, um, get the applicant to undertake public consultation and then bring it back when we have a better feel of this. Through the chair. To yes. Your, to your motion. I would, uh, I would disagree with your motion. If, if the province environment is looking at doing a pilot project, I say we, 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 we voted in opposition to this application until the province has set up their own site on their own land, these people can go and deal with the province and they can be used as a pilot project with environment on their land. And when they come back with, with some positive numbers from that pilot project, which would probably be in two or three or four years, then they could come back and we might reconsider it. But right now I wouldn't, I wouldn't defer it. That means we have to look at it again. Well, we and do not, where I, as, I, as I, far as I know, AEP has not stated, so without looking at, without knowing whether or not they're going to designate something like this as a pilot project, are we not stepping, sort of overstepping? Just, so if we just wait, just, we can, I, just we, the fact that Environment is saying that they're willing to look at a pilot project is they don't understand the process or what's going on in, in it yet. So I would be opposed to anything within the county. And as our last speaker said, we're basically dealing with Calgary's garbage again prepackaged food waste is going to come back out here and we're going to end up with the same problem there that we got on the northeast side of Stratford. So no, I'm, I'm opposed to it totally until the, the province has done their due diligence, they've run their pilot, they've come out with some, and, and that's, they're not going to do that in a year. So. If you like, I'll just read to you what AEP said about that. So it said, we were discussing it and how we would regulate composting diapers. It may fall under a pilot project, which we are adding in the new compost COP. So a limited term authorization and then a review to determine feasibility. The public review of the new draft COP should be ready in the next couple of weeks. So again, I say until they finalize their pilot project, and I don't, I don't think Personally, I don't want to be the pilot project. Administration, how how do we address this? The fact that um, we don't have we don't have we don't know where the we don't know what the ball field is, or what the game we're playing is going to look like. So how do we address this in the meantime? Like you don't I, play the game. So how what what is MPC's wishes and how do we do this? I agree with them. 
I like Tom's suggestion, actually. Wait for AUP. Get get public consultation input. There was a lot of questions. They were all looking for information. I don't know um, how much they got out and talked to the, to the residents. Well, Steve Florent here. Uh, if I can ask a question. Uh, um, uh, no, sorry. We're, we're not allowing any more comments at this time. Thank you. For me, one of the key things in that note from Alberta Environment and Parks is that it would be a limited term um, pilot project. So um, my preference certainly would be to see the next draft. I would actually prefer to see the final composting regulation so that we know what any organization that might be looking at this type of operation in our municipality would be working under. The next thing, I like philosophically, I think it's brilliant if we could successfully compost diapers there. I was reading there like 6% of what goes into landfill or something. It's an issue, but we don't have strong evidence of it being done successfully without impacting adjacent residents. And we know that that's the key. So I don't know if it could come back after the composting regulations are finalized and if we could look at a limited term DP. Is that possible? Because I know it's not like home based or like I know we can do, there's some DPs where we do like a, a time limit on them. Correct. And the conditions that I did propose had limited it to a one year term and then to be reviewed with no, no guarantee of any future renewal or the length. It could be another one year term or we could do it for a six month term, whatever, whatever MPC's wishes are. And I did like Commissioner Kester's. I do have pretty significant concerns about because it appears that the majority of the operation is happening indoors. I, I have grave concerns because I think it was mentioned this uh, like subjective nature of odor and not like one person's perception of odor could be that there is no odor and yet other people could be perceiving significant odor impacts. So that's a challenging one for us to um, even put, you know, into the, it's hard to regulate and enforce, I guess. Um, and then the other concerns about having the finished compost um, outdoors and um, certainly ideally that would be an odor free product but um, unfortunately we've had experience where there can be finished product that does have impact on adjacent um, landowners so those are my main concerns. Just to elaborate on that, I, I mean I fully agree with Ben and I, I can't see myself supporting this development but if it was good with uh, Alberta Environment, I, I still don't think this is the right spot for such a development. I mean, we're looking at the community aspect of this. We have places in the county that if there are large amounts of um, adjacent landowner issues, we have industrial parks. We have to think about smart development and not just randomly put developments in acreage areas and farming communities. We have places for this. I, I'm not against this development. If, if AEP is okay with it, I'm against where it's at. And until AEP has everything finalized, I'm not even going to look at this. But when that day comes, we have to think about smart development and I don't think this location is very Myself, I look at the options that we have here and I would be option two to not accept and approve the recommendation as opposed, proposed because there's several things that are going on. Um, we've learned from other areas, feedstock issues, things like that. It, there's so much general. And in order to narrow this in and have oversight over it, who's going to pay for that? Are we going to have higher staff members to overlook compost facilities, which we're pretty much doing now? We're not recovering those costs in any way, shape or form, and I don't see it happening in the future. Um, it needs work. I've stood before the province and the minister about composting. They're working on it. I want to see what they come back with. I'm hoping it is a happy medium, but until such time, I don't want to, I can't support anything with it. Uh, Glenn here. Sorry? Glenn. Hello, Glenn. can you hear me? Yes, I've got Glenn. my buttons. Yeah, I, in, in regards to my previous comments, and after hearing uh, this deferral 
motion and uh, AEP's concerns, I would think that a new application would be coming forward with, because this is going to change substantially with environment, with the public consultation, with the indoor storage, with uh, monitoring and who's paying for it, who's going to clean it up. That is more probably or just as much as we've already got in front of us. So it's a substantial change, I'm thinking, in this uh, application. So I do, I'm not in favor of a deferral. I would be more in favor of, uh, of a brand new application with uh, staff know now what, uh, what we're looking for to check off before it comes back. And I would be way happier with that. In fact, that's the way I'll vote. Thanks. Through the chair, the other the other aspect I've been thinking about is if we defer it, it gives the op applicant the the feeling that it may be allowed at a later date, and they dump more money into this site and into public consultation. And at the end of the day, if we aren't going to allow it, it's it's. Uh, putting more more cost onto that individual or that company. So that's why I say if they if they go to environment, environment's looking at changing the laws, the regulations, they're looking at putting a pilot in place. To me, their best best bet is to work with environment and set up a pilot someplace and get it done. Not to spend any more money here because like I said, this this does not fit as councillors Member Wilson said it doesn't fit the area for sure. And uh, I'm tired of taking Calgary's garbage. Mm -hmm. Member Link. Just for clarity, and my interpretation could be wrong, my interpretation of the note from Alberta Environment was not necessarily that they were willing to run this as a pilot project, but that they would look at um, authorizing it under a pilot project. Is that, like, it wouldn't be their project. It would be how they would, like, register it. Is that... That was my understanding as well. Either way, it would be a project in that location. That's what I'm hearing from a lot of them. That's what they're opposed. It's not the right location for it. Mm -hmm. And if the government runs a pilot there and they come up and say, yes, it is, then how are you going to argue against allowing it to continue there? Exactly. So my feeling is with the commission that my motion is probably not um, it's going to pass. No, it's going to pass. So I will withdraw my motion. So what are <laughs> what are what is the commission's wishes? You don't even want to try. You I'll just quit. I'll move that the application be refused as it doesn't fit with our within our parameters of our land use bylaw. So we have a Option motion. Two. We have a motion before us. Is there anybody against it? I did like the deferral, but I also didn't think we're ready for to approve it yet. So I will, um, I'll accept the motion from Ben, hoping that there is another, maybe possibly another um, permit coming up. Is that where you want those things done? I feel that the the community had so many questions about what it was all about that they didn't have a chance to either, you know, when you don't have knowledge, it's it's very um, frightful to be having this in your backyard. And, but but I did get a lot saying that no matter what, they wouldn't wouldn't have wanted it there. So. And we have industrial parks for special events. Yeah, that's true. In response, I guess, Donna, I'll, just from, what we've learned with the existing site that we have, if there is concerns of the residents that? Mo moving forward, that uh, they do not get resolved. Mm -hmm. There is no mechanism in place. There is, and that's why these composting guidelines are so key to be changed, yeah. because then there's cause and effect. Right now, there's cause and no effect. So, I fully and, and support this. Background. Be, be uh, not accepted. I think it's the wrong location. I think it should be an industrial site. I think it should be completely indoors. And I'm speaking from a lot of experience. And uh, yeah, I fully support this. 
because at the end of the day, we're responsible to our residents. And if their property values go down or things like that, we have to be able to answer those questions. We have to be able to make sure that we did our due diligence at the start, and this is the perfect time to do it. So, And it's up to the person that's uh, applying for the permit to have all these questions answered to us. It's not up to us to go out and sell it to the public. Call the question. Call the vote. Hearing no negatives, the application is denied. We are on to DP 2020-60, Cannabis Store in Clooney. Yes, so once again, I'm going to go to page 30 to look at the appendix and some photos and mapping. So here we have the location within the hamlet of Clooney. It is on the same site as the as a liquor store that's been operating there. Um, so here was our circulation area to the entire hamlet. We didn't receive any comments. Um, so um, just some particulars. The parcel is currently util utilized as a mixed use parcel. That's what it's zoned and that's how it's used, which means it's a combination of commercial and residential. The context of the area is everything else is residential in the area. So this change of the site will make it a more intensive commercial use amongst residential lots. However, we did not receive any comments from any of the residences. So the site received permits for a general store as far back as 1989 with a liquor store operating on site since 2005. And just uh, some policy evaluation. So I'm on page 33, just looking at some aerial photos, site site photos. Um, there is no IDP or ASP in the area. The application meets the requirements for a cannabis store, which is in the LUB, and it's a discretionary use in the mixed use district. It does meet the MDP in most respects. However, it does mention in the MDP that there could be a cumulative impact um, and, to and to keep our eye on a cumulative impact. So there is that potential to have a liquor store and a cannabis store in one location, maybe there will be an impact because of that. The conclusion, in conclusion, my recommendation is on page 24 if you want to look, but DEFA recommending approval of the cannabis store with the proposed conditions based on the following. The nearest residence has a separation buffer, which includes a fence and mature trees. All of the residents in the hamlet were circulated, including the nearest neighbor, and no responses were received. The building will need to meet AGLC and safety code requirements for a cannabis store, and the applicant has already been consulting with these parties to determine what the requirements are. So um, the options, which are on page 28 of the agenda, are the same standard three options, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. MPC's wishes. So this is uh, the first one we've had to deal with. Interesting location. There's one big concern that I have, and I know though there wasn't any objections from the community, there is the idea that it could change the culture of the area. We, we see what certain developments do in other neighboring hamlets and I don't want to risk that being done in Clooney. <laughs> I don't know how to say it <laughs> any slighter than that. Um, I don't want to turn down business either because um, they have operated a liquor store without a lot of nuisance problems, unlike Gleeson. And so I would be curious if MPC would be willing to put a firm on this DP for one year to see what the effects on the community are. Okay. 
I'm, I'm curious that the RCMP did not respond to, to any of this. Like, they, they have no concerns about this. They did not submit a response, and I did circulate to them. Thank you. Alberta, please. Just wondering if um, the cost of changing it and um, that would be my only concern. But I, I did like your idea about one year. Of changing what? Um, changing it to a retail store from what it is. What it is, I don't think that's our concern, to be quite honest. So if you, it's a one year term and it, well, no, you're right. It's not our concern. It, it'd be no different than leasing a spot and yep. if your business right. doesn't work, right? So I, I liked your idea. Like I'm kind of hesitant about something like this, but I do know what's in the new way of life. Um, because I mean, I, I use the Clooney liquor store. It's very well kept. Uh, there's not a lot of nuisance problems. And if if the cannabis retail store can be similar to that, there's no issues. But if it takes a life of its own and creates problems for the community and the adjacent neighbors, I'd like to know that we can do something in a year to mitigate those problems. So I, I would I would move for approval with the addition of uh, number nine condition a year time frame. I don't know what the proper terminology is. I'll leave that up to staff, but I'd like to perfect. Perfect. If there's another discussion, I'll move that exact. I agree with what you're saying. I just don't like the way it's written. It will be re revisited in the, it's like here you're saying you can have it for a year and that's it. I think well, what we're saying it, is like, after a year, or the will. permit will be issued for a year, then it will be reevaluated. I would rather, to be quite honest, I would rather it expire and then them ha have to do this again and then we'll know whether there was any problems. I I'd rather the I'm not saying it not expire, but I'm just saying put something in there that at that time it will be reevaluated. So they, because if, if that was me looking at that, I'd say, oh, I'm not going to do it. If, I, if, I'm, if I've only got a year, I'm not going to put anything into it. If you put something in there that gives me an idea that after the year, if things have gone good, then I still have a chance to maintain that over. I agree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's just the optics of it. So you want it brought, you just basically, um, Member Wilson, you just want it brought back, when it's reviewed, it's brought back before the commission as opposed yeah. to being reviewed in-house. In-house, I want it brought back to the commission. Oh. I'd like to see it come back to MPC too for education for us to know yeah. how do we this know is, then how this is such a new how it works new issue, a new development and kind of something nobody has ever done before so just for our own education like yeah. I said no matter what bring it back to MPC you guys break well Number nine be modified up there, or am I just do, 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 do. Yeah. Wait, waiting? Okay, the way it is. Are we, are we good with the way it is, or we, we have the so. The local councillor was supporting this, so it will expire in one year, and then they would have to reapply to MPC. Yeah. Okay, so that's the way. Is it what is that right? implies? That's what that implies. Thank you. Will there be a way for the, just thinking and operating a business, so the way it said, kind of like Ben was saying, would there be a way that they can come in earlier so they can continue their business without having a stopgap? Can we set that up? Is there a way to do that? Or it expires? Just give it two months. They say um, reapplication could be May something. 
right? Mm -hmm. So they have a chance to keep their business continuing. If they're all successful, last thing we want to do is stop a business. Yeah. Right. Point. One hundred percent. Three months yeah. prior. Two months prior. Yeah. Do you accept that? Yep. Friendly amendment. No, no. MPC uh, Nevington. Thank you. I, I know it. Glenn, can you um, are are you able to view? Um, no. No. No, I can't. Okay, so but number it's, nine. Uh, one year. So number nine is going to be a permit to be issued for a one-year term expiring on July 14, 2021. Reapplication may be submitted three months prior to expiry. Sounds great to me. Okay, so we have a motion in front of us with the amendment. Are there any negative votes? Hearing none, it is passed. Thank you. Chair, can we take a five? <laughs> we are now on to DP 2020-065, uh, dwelling accessory. Chair Eichert, can we take five? Oh, sorry, we take a five minute break. We will be back at 1013. <laughs> Six, five. Glenn, are you there? I am here. Perfect. Thank you. Hello. So are we good? We're yep. good, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so this is for a dwelling accessory. And I will again go to the appendix location plan. And I apologize, these appendix are like labeled incorrectly from A and B and whatever, but we are on page 42 of the agenda and we are six miles northwest of Strathmore for this acreage. We circulated within a mile. Here's our circulation area in Appendix E, which, sorry about that, but um, we did receive one response uh, with the, uh, somebody that was concerned who thought that they were already having people living on their property in an RV. And I did ask the applicant about it and he said what they were doing was renovating their basement. They had their RV and they had a porta potty parked in their yard for the trades people to use because they didn't want them in their bathroom during COVID. So they said that that's all they said was going on. So um, some aerial photos of the property. There's the single family dwelling there. It's a 1.21 hectare or three acre country residential parcel. It has an existing 2,150 square foot single family dwelling and the parcel is accessed via Range Road 255. Shares a driveway, it would share a driveway with the primary residence. They both will share the existing water well but would have their own septic field. So on page 45, Five here, so there's the yeah, their proposed site plan here on 44, and that shouldn't be there. So page 45, we've got some photos. So here's the proposed new dwelling, and here is the existing resident. So they've tried to kind of mimic the peaks and the columns and make it kind of a similar style. This application meets all the requirements for a dwelling accessory, and the MDP does support. Um, ensuring residents have an access to a range of affordable housing types and a diversity of choices to accommodate all stages of life. And that is everything. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Suzanne. Welcome. Oh, sorry, that wasn't everything. I didn't tell you my the option, sorry. So um, on page 37 of the report, it does say staff are recommending approval of the dwelling accessory with the proposed conditions. Based on the following, the proposed application is a discretionary use in the CR district. Both dwellings have a similar style and it fits within the context of the area, which is primarily agricultural and residential. And MPC has the standard three options to consider. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion before us. What are MPC's wishes? Or, or sorry, we, yeah. What are MPC's wishes? Um, 
I support this. I just had uh, adjacent neighbors talk to me, and one of them was a farmer, and he said uh, just concerned about if he's irrigating his pasture um, with it being close to the fence that uh, these people are aware that there may be some water overspray at some times and things like that. Um, like you said, he has his right to do what he wants. Of course, he doesn't want to spray on somebody's land if he doesn't have a choice, and it's just irrigation water. But it's uh, you know winds change and things like that. So, and the setbacks here, I'm not sure which quarter he irrigates. I was looking at the north. I thought it was he was talking about the east quarter, but not really sure which one it is. But I think it's 20 feet away from the fence. What I saw. Next month must be more than that. 19.34 feet. That's what they have from the from the north and 59.25 from the east, so it should be okay. <coughs> yeah, and I've made that clear too, but you know, sometimes winds change or whatever, and I told my bring his concerns forward, so. I'm sorry, can you, I'm really confused on these maps. I'm just looking and they don't seem to fit together. Um, this, this one is a mistake, I apologize. Okay. But so that was the circulation map was up here. Okay. So I apologize for that. Oh, that's okay. I was just like, what? I know. <laughs> so I, I just have the same uh, concerns as I always do when it comes to secondary or dwellings as accessory on parcel on acreages. You have so many per quarter. Two houses on every one. It's not something that I've ever been in favor of. I think we're fragmenting Eggland and bringing acreage people into farming communities that sometimes cause more issues than anything else. So it might not be these people. I'm sure these people are great, but five families down the road, I think we should be consolidating acreages into certain areas of the county. <laughs> Like you go a mile south and there's we've kind of shown that there's 40 acre parcels that we can subdivide further south. So same concerns as usual. I can speak to a little bit about what you're talking about there. Um, being the division councilor there for a number of years now, I think I've maybe had three times where I've had issues between agriculture and acreage owners. And I'd be, I'm, be honest, I'm surprised it's that low that I've gotten involved in. There may have been other stuff. I've talked to some of the the agricultural people there, and I say if something comes along, by all means, get a hold of me. And for the most part, it's generally you just talk to both parties, and it's pretty straightforward. These times, like right now, people are a little more edgy. But, uh, so, but for you know, and I think Tom's division is the same as mine. We're very mixed with uh, residential and agriculture, and I I gotta honestly say it actually works quite well. So for the most part. I, I, I um, sort of mirror Scott's comments in the fact that I, I believe that it's it's a different mindset. People that come out to the acreages, it's it's not like when you have a a, a, a complete subdivision where they take they'll take 40 acres and put 40 houses on it, and then the farmer, because then you sort of have citified citified that area. People come out here for I believe. On, on the whole, come out to an acreage and understand that it, it is it is a more a rustic, more primitive, uh, and that dealing with the, the farmers is, is like I said, those those that do the first acreage always think that way. However, once once that family moves out, and it takes what five families to find somebody who sticks on an acreage, and there's no guarantee that those people understand that culture and lifestyle. <laughs> And like I said, you have a quarter section here, and you can have four parcels out, five parcels out without uh, ASP, and two houses on each, 10 houses, and then the, the parent parcel could have two houses if it's greater, over, greater than 80 acres. So that's 12 houses on a quarter section. Your quarter section across the road could have that. That's, that's a very high density population and that's the problem that I have. And, and I believe that the county is doing a pretty good job in, in, in 
isolating where we're where we're doing our fragmentation, right? So, and this falls, I believe, falls into sort of that area like when you talk about west of the town of Strathmore. I believe that's. I mean, it's it's difficult to move people. It's that statement in real estate: it's location, location, location. So, I think we're doing a a, a good job, and I I have no concerns. And I understand, I, I understand your concerns. Consistency is yeah, key. Yeah, exactly. True. Member Link. Um, I do see what Commissioner Wilson is saying. And occasionally I do hear about sort of interface issues between egg producers and acre donors. I think one thing that is key to note on this is that we are not increasing fragmentation. It's already fragmented. This is increasing density, which can have its pros and cons but at least dwelling secondary does not contribute to increased fragmentation. So that was my only point. So through the chair, I, I agree with where Member Wilson's coming from, but we got to remember that originally, and every time there's an acreage applied for, it's not the county that's applying for it. It's a landowner that owns that land, so they're creating their own problem, and sometimes they get upset with the problem that they've created, but they are the ones that are selling it. Nobody's holding the gun to their head. We just have to try and make sure we have the regulations in place that control the, 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 proper, uh, the proper growth and so that it's, it's, what's the word? Yeah. Sustainable growth or reasonable growth, but it's still, the ag producer that's selling the land in the first place. So, but I do agree that, and it's happening more over here than it is in other areas, but it is happening in the other areas too. So, so I'll put the motion forward. We take option one that we accept and approve the recommendation as proposed. Thank you. We have a motion for us. Anybody against the motion? Yes. There is a member against the motion, so I will take a roll call um, vote. Um, Eichert is, is, is in favor of the motion. Armstrong? Bigger? Claassen? In favor. Kester? In favor. Link? In favor. Wilson? Opposed. The motion passes. We now move on to DP 2020-70. So this application is for a home-based business type three. And we'll go to the location plan on page 52. So we are one mile south of Highway 22X and a half a mile west of Highway 24. It is an acreage. Um, 24 acre parcel, Ag General. Here was our circulation area within one mile. We did not receive any written responses. We did receive um, a phone call asking some questions and her concerns were addressed. Um, so we have no circulation responses officially. So here is the parcel with a existing shop on there. It's among acreages. And here is the site plan. So they're proposing to put the business in this existing location, in this existing shop. Here's their parking area. Policy evaluation, it does meet the requirements for an HBB3. We'll go to page 55 here. There's just, um, they do operate within the city of Calgary right now. So that's their, their sign that they have in Calgary and this is where they propose to put it. Um, they, um, it does meet the requirements of an HBB3, and it does align with the MDP, which facil says it facilitates employment for residents within close proximity of their home. So there's the existing building. The recommendation is on page 46 of the uh, report. And we are recommending approval for this HBB3 based on the following. The business will occur in an existing accessory building which will receive a safety code inspection to ensure it meets the requirements for a commercial building. 
Business has no outdoor storage, so no screening of materials will be required. On page 59 of the report, uh, we provide the three standard options, and that is everything. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Suzanne. MPC's wishes. I'll move that we approve uh, DP 2020-70 as presented. So motion before us, any, any opposition to this motion? Hearing none, it is passed. Uh, we are now on to subdivision applications, so we are doing uh, SD 2020-009. Good morning, MPC members. This is Graham Allison, Planner One, uh, presenting subdivision application SD 2020-009 to subdivide part of Southwest 112426 west of the fourth to create one parcel consisting of three acres with a 35.06 uh, acre remainder parcel. If you refer to the map located on page 63 of your MPC package, uh, you'll see the parcel is on a service road adjacent to Highway 24, approximately one kilometer north of Cheadle. Staff circulated this application to external agencies and internally, uh, as well as to adjacent landowners within a one mile radius of the subject lands and no objections were received. Uh, you can see a tentative plan of this subdivision on page 64 of your MPC package. Um, the parcel we, was redesignated from Agricultural General District to Industrial General on March 24th, 2020. The proposed parcel contains a stair construction business that has been in business since 2005 uh, and has not received any complaints. The proposed parcel contains three existing shop buildings and it's serviced by a private well and private septic disposal system. The remainder parcel contains a dwelling that is also serviced by a private well and private septic disposal system. Both parcels will be accessed by a shared approach off of the service road on Highway 24. The proposed subdivision generally supports the strategies, objectives, and policies within the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, Regional Growth Management Strategy, Municipal Development Plan, and Land Use Bylaw. Both parcels are serviced by private well and septic systems and have approaches built. Um, it's also worth noting that this is within the WASP and as an industrial uh, parcel, it supports the goals of the WASP as well. Um, as per the Municipal Government Act, Municipal Reserve will be required on the subdivision. An appraisal prepared May 11, 2020 determined the per acre value of this parcel is 6,885 on the entire, entire parcel, totaling three acres. The amount of cash in lieu of Municipal Reserve owing to Wheatland County will be approximately $2,066, though the exact amount will be determined based on the final plan of survey. Administration is recommending that Municipal Planning Commission approve this subdivision application, SD 2020-009, subject to the conditions noted in the planning report. That concludes this presentation, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Just a question to staff. Does that assessment of value of the land, does that sound low to you? To the rest of the council, when they're well, when they're selling ag land, forty-five miles east of there for fifty-two to fifty-four hundred dollars an acre. Eleven thousand south of there. Yeah. Well, yeah, that I mean, sounds a little low for that. It is, it is industrial land inside Wheatland West. So, um, can you can it, administration? Yeah, precisely that, uh, Commissioner Eichert. But I'm wondering if Graham, if you can talk about the. Uh, because you had indicated with regards to the appraisal value. Can you talk about that process? Uh, sure, yeah, through the chair. So the appraisal report uh, I have, or I can I can pull up. Um, it, was, it was conducted after the redesignation of the land. I'm not sure, uh, I'll have to reference uh, what all the criteria was, um, but that was that was the per acre value of the, or the bare land per acre value of this industrial parcel. Uh, I'd have to uh, go back and, and look at this uh, the appraisal report in more detail to see if there's any other details as to why it was that amount. 
So is there some way we can um, I, I, I would question the 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 amount of money that that's being appraised at just only because of location being in an industrial park being a, being part of now being well whether you're in an industrial park or not just the location just the location itself whether you're zoned for whatever whether you're in industrial park in farmland that area is well oh, yeah you're right it's like so whether, there was there was a couple sections that did go for eleven thousand an acre but it's I'm also looking at the signs on the highway that tell me that what they're asking per acre for that land and it's substantially more than sixty eight hundred dollars so. So how do we? Yeah, how do we? Just, yeah, how, how do you like to administration? How do we? Actually, um, I don't. I don't want to question the value, but I'm questioning the value. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so uh, the manager of planning just indicated that we can modify um, the condition um, to remove the actual value, and we can work with the appraiser to get a, determine a new value. So in the conditions. Where are my conditions? Here we go. So number four. Right. You have the values. So we can remove those values in essence. And I know that Sherry's drafting language, but we can remove those values. There's not. Right there. Good morning, Sherry speaking. Um, what I would suggest is that we would also change the condition to remove the dollar amount based on any um, revised appraisal value because it's usually within 30 days when the application is submitted, but we are permitted if we question the appraisal value to talk to the appraiser to find out how they came to that evaluation. But we would also need to allow time quickly to let the applicant know within 30 days of that revised valuation because he may not um, agree and may wish to appeal. Yeah, I, I can live with I, I can live with that modification. So um, I will, I will um, move MPC approve SD 2020-009 with the modification on number four. Uh, is there anyone opposed? Just to clarify, with all of the conditions, but with the revision to four. That is correct. Is there any opposition? Fine. Hearing none, uh, the uh, it, it is moved. It's been accepted. <laughs> um, no other planning matters. No thing in closed measures. So, MPC I is. I have I have one. Oh, just to, sorry. It's not a planning, but it is with to do with a, a development. I went to uh, just so that it's on record. I went to the uh, Hazar uh, Council meeting over some land issues within the town of Hazar because we own property in there. And uh, the discussion of Remedex came up and uh, they were questioning council. And then because I was there, then they turned around and started questioning me and council asked me to to explain it. So I told the, the person that was asking the question and council that I would speak to the process of the public hearing and not to the application. So I explained what the public hearing was because their questions were, if the town put uh, 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 put something forward to the public hearing, would it carry more weight than if the individuals did it? That type of the town was not. So I said everybody has the has the the right to make a presentation at the public hearing, and the council at the time has to take everything that was brought forward to the public hearing into consideration when they make the judgment and nothing more. So I told him, I said, if you want to talk to me outside about it, I will not talk to you about it. So 
just so it's on the record if somebody said something. Excuse me. Thank you, Ben. Can I have a motion to adjourn? You don't need one. Don't I need one? No. I thought I did. I meeting is terminated. Thank you. Oh, for sure.